Hello, I'm Lance Turner of Arkansas Business, and I'm here with Gina Radke, the CEO of Galley Support Innovations of Sherwood, and we're here to talk about leadership. Gina, thanks for coming in today. Thank you for having me. Uh, first, before we get into this, I think we want to talk a little bit about Galley Support Innovations and what it is. Uh, I think there's some things about your company, how it works, the origins of it, that I think will inform a lot of our discussion. So, first, if you could tell us a little bit of the story about how you and your husband, Wade, who is the mm -hmm. Chief Operating Officer, uh, how you came to uh, purchase the company that became Galley Support Innovations. It's kind of a funny story actually. I was um, not for it at all, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. uh, we flipped a house in Florida in Destin right at the peak of the market, uh, did really well on that. Mm -hmm. We decided we wanted to be in business for ourselves, um, looked at some franchises, and Wade's grandfather started a company in California and his grandmother actually contacted Wade and said, maybe you guys should look into this company. Uh, the uncle had it at the time. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, it was kind of interesting because um, it was an estranged family arrangement and so we just kind of went to the uncle and said, hey, just looking at it. Um, I'm a real go over the details type person. So in the end, we came to a, an agreement that we would not purchase the company outright. We would purchase the assets, rename it, move it to Arkansas. Did not want to raise my kids in LA right. um, and start from here there. We manufacture and design interior hardware for aircraft. So um, our big claim to fame is the Boeing 747 mm -hmm. um, occupied vacant latch. Um, okay, there you yeah. go. So that's the one that everyone knows. Right. However, the ones that our engineers enjoy more and my husband enjoys designing more for are like the Gulfstream 650, mm -hmm. all the interior locks and latches um, in those aircraft. And so we do a lot of corporate aviation. Mm -hmm. We're kind of like the Rolex of corporate aviation. Okay. Um, you can, we don't sell things that you can just get off the shelf. We do everything one off for our customers. When it came time for you to buy the business, what, how, how did you and your husband, I'm interested in how you, you determine what the roles would be. Did, did one person have a particular set of skills that you thought this person needs to do this job or how, how, did, you, how did you get that relationship out? And then how do you guys work together to, to lead? Well, when we started, I actually started off as sales and marketing. Um, I had done nonprofit fundraising before, and my husband had, was an industrial engineer, so he was going to do, you know, the industrial side and business side. And then the market fell flat. Uh, mm -hmm. My husband actually took a position somewhere else because our employees, we knew they wouldn't be able to find jobs. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was four people, two of them were felons, and we knew who wasn't going to be able to, they weren't going to be able to get a job. Right. So he took a position somewhere else, and that's when I became... CEO, I mean, doing everything. And I have just started researching everything I could and, and learned about manufacturing. And, and um, eventually we grew the business and I said, you've got to come back or we're going to sell it. You know, I can't do this on my own. He came back and about three months into it, you know, I was like, oh, thank God, here, you take it and do right. everything. About three months into it, he said, you know, I really think that you're better at actually running the business than I am. Um, and I'd been running production meetings and quality systems and everything. And mm -hmm. he loves to design and innovate. Mm -hmm. So at that point, um, we kind of separated and he became the COO and I became the CEO. And um, it's interesting because we both have type A personalities. Right. Usually in a marriage, I think you've got one quiet person and one not, or one you know who's the leader and one who's maybe you know kind of the doer. Mm -hmm. uh, we will both come in and take charge of anything. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes before we'd go into sales meetings or even productions meetings, we'd say, okay, whose production meeting is this? Is it yours or is it mine this time? Right. Or, you know, um, so it's kind of been interesting uh, where it's been a struggle a little bit. You mm -hmm. know, we're 11 years in now mm -hmm. and we're doing really well. Um, but now we've grown so much that he really has his area and I really have mine. Mm -hmm. And so that's been good for us. At this point, we have two facilities, mm -hmm. one here and then one in Seattle. And we have 28 employees here and then we have one in Seattle. Okay. So Seattle will grow um, as contracts in that area will grow. Okay. So another thing that I think people should know about in terms of the company is your employees mm -hmm. and where they come from and their backgrounds. Um, and there's also, I think, what you describe as the ministry that you feel that you and your husband have for these employees. Um, so tell me about your employees. Well, we hire employees from several different um, areas, I guess you would say. One of the things I think most people key in on is we do hire ex-felons. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I call them ex-felons because I say, hey, if you're committing felonies, you don't need to work for me. Mm -hmm. I know that there's probably a better term, right. um, the correct PC term, but it tends to work at our facility, so we use it. Mm -hmm. um, and we hire 
like I said, ex-felons we hire, and um, people that have come out of drug rehab programs. Um, we do want them to be associated with a program and have graduated, because mm -hmm. um, we understand that it's really hard for people to get a second chance mm -hmm. um, in business and in the workplace. And so we know that these people um, are not um, throwaway, they're not useless to society. Some of our best employees have come out of, honestly, either the prison system or drug rehab programs. Mm -hmm. And um, and the great thing, though, about hiring people that have come out of the prison um, or drug rehab programs is they can watch the other people that we bring in. And so they know the game, so to speak. Right. So if someone is gonna maybe get off a little, they can go to them and say, hey, I feel like, you know, what's going on in your life? And so they really keep Wade and I informed of um, kind of the culture of the company and, and the triggers that kind of go on sometimes with hiring um, people who have, you know, had a past. Right. They've been there. And so they see the, the newer folks coming up and, and they've been on a certain journey mm -hmm. and they can help guide them on their journey. Exactly. Yes. What, what is it about... Um, this group of employees that really works for your company? What, what are the qualities that they possess that make them just perfect for your, your operation? Well, I think one thing is they're hungry. Mm -hmm. uh, they're willing to work. They're willing to do anything. And a lot of them um, are skilled. I mm -hmm. mean, they honestly, most of our skilled, I won't say most, several of our skilled laborers have come out of the prison system. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have a great skill set, they have a great hunger, they're very appreciative. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they really, they just work well. Um, honestly, once they're in the door, we don't look at them any different. We don't, mm -hmm. you know, we forget sometimes who mm -hmm. is and who's not. And um, so they just blend right in and you know, just become a normal member of society. So what are the, what then are the challenges that, that you might face and how do you overcome those challenges? We don't have a lot of challenges with mm -hmm. them. Um, sometimes there's parole hearings they need to go to or, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, probation hearings, but um, they're just great employees just like everyone else. I would imagine then as a leader of a pretty diverse workforce then, that you may find yourself doing the thing that I think a lot of leaders don't expect to do, and that's sort of get in the weeds of someone's personal life. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? We're up front. When they come, we say, listen, especially if they've come from a sorted background, mm -hmm. uh, we say we're going to we're going to be in your personal life because it's important for the culture of our company. Um, it's important for you as a person. And um, so we're very upfront about it. And then a lot of times I don't think that they believe us until they've seen it with either other employees or they've been with us long enough to experience that we have an open, open door policy. Mm -hmm. You can come in anytime. You may have to make an appointment, you know, catch us there, but we want to talk to you and we want to know what's going on in your life. And so, and we pray for our employees. We see how resources that we can get to help them. Um, because a happy employee makes a happy workplace, a happy workplace makes quality products, and quality products is good customer service. When you're looking for leaders to come up out of your organization then, what are the qualities that you're gonna be looking for and then how do you personally go about trying to develop and, and sharpen those skills? One of the qualities we look for is character. We always say that we hire for character over skill any day. Mm -hmm. And um, so we look for the character, the person that's willing to do anything. You know, they. I filled out an application, the, or an application, a uh, well, it was a volunteer application, mm -hmm. and I filled it out, and they said, describe what you do at your job. And I said, I'm the owner, I make multinational, or international multi-million dollar deals, and I scrub the toilets. Right. So those type of people are who we're looking for, the ones who are willing to do anything, um, and the ones who are teachable, and who are willing to learn. And so um, we look for those guys, we hire them, um, we move them up quickly. We like to hire and promote from within. And then we invest in them everything we can. We send them to classes, we send them to conferences, we invest in their families. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, if you've been with us for so long, you get to take a family cruise. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really invest in them as a whole person. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are our biggest things. And I think that they're appreciative of it. Um, and we cast the vision to them and then where they can see themselves in it. Right. Um, not just, hey, this is my vision and this is where we're gonna go. It's, this is our vision, mm -hmm. and where are you gonna play a part in it? And if it's not here, maybe it's over here. Mm -hmm. So we like to give them the opportunity to decide where they fit, um, to take a, a line from, um, from good to great, where they fit on the bus. Right. You know, maybe it's not here, maybe it's there. Um, and that's another thing we do. We go through motivational books and um, leadership books every month, a different book. And so, and they have great ideas. And so we listen to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the point is we really allow them to 
see themselves in the vision, be part of the vision, and then cast a little bit of that vision on their own. Mm -hmm. that, that seems to be a thing that I hear among people who talk about leadership a lot is, is sharing the vision and making sure everyone yes. is pulling in the same direction. Yeah. Are there other things that you do to sort of enfor reinforce that? Um, allowing them to re recant the vision to everyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a old saying, I don't know who came up with it, but it was, if you're tired of sharing the vision, share it 10 more times and then get someone else to share it for you. Yeah. Um, and so that's, we since they've got that ownership, mm -hmm. they'll go and they'll share the vision. Um, and so, you know, we, of course, you know, we come together often. We meet with our executive um, leadership team once a week. We have a 20 minute stand up meeting, but we're with them all the time um, throughout the week. And so we always talk about the vision. And at every staff meeting, we say, okay, we've got two products, what are they? And our staff can tell you, it's a people product and a physical product. And we build the physical product to build the people product. And so they repeat it and they, you know, it becomes part of them. Um, you know, I tried little cute posters and you know, all this stuff on the wall and, and none of that, um, took hold as much as allowing them to start sharing the vision with others. Mm -hmm. So sometimes even if we have a new person come on staff, we'll do an all-call meeting, everybody will come together, we'll introduce everyone, and then we'll have another um, staff member say, tell them about our vision. Mm -hmm. And then they get to repeat it, and they get to own it, and they get to talk about their piece in the vision of Galley Support Innovations. I think a thing that can be intimidating to new leaders and managers is the time that it takes to be a leader, yeah. and I think that's stuff that's not ever really accounted for. You account for the time it takes for you to make a thing, mm -hmm. take the, the raw materials and, and process it and then ship it out the door, but I don't know that you always account for the leadership time. How do you square off with the time that you've got to spend doing those kinds of things, the inspiring things, the coaching moments with the nuts and bolts of everyday running a business? Mm -hmm. I'm very lucky, I'll be honest. At this point, we about five years ago, we decided we were gonna hire our replacements. And so we have guys in there that do amazing stuff. So as opposed to spending 80% on the business and 20% on leadership, now I'm about 80% on leadership and 20% on wow. the business. Okay. Yeah, and it's phenomenal. Um, so let's hope that they all stay around because I may no not kidding. know what I'm doing when, if someone leaves. That's but. right. Well, I want to talk a little bit about you personally and sort of your, your personal development. When, when was the first time that you were put in a leadership position and what was the thing that you learned from that experience? You know, that's funny. The first thing that came to mind was actually eighth grade drill team yeah, right. in middle school, yeah. and I was the co-captain. Um, and I will say what I learned from that was just a title is not leadership. You know, a position is not leadership. Um, I got, you know, eighth grade girl, big head, and thought I was all that. And I remember mm -hmm. thinking, you know, going through that year thinking, if I would have started off respecting other people, this would be a whole different ballgame. So. Mm -hmm. What has been your, your sort of big leadership challenge in all this? For me, it was communication in mm -hmm. the beginning. Um, I was very much a um, kind of go and you know do your own thing and just tell me how you got it done type mm -hmm. person. And that doesn't work for everyone. Um, and so I actually, we do annual reviews for everyone mm -hmm. and I sent out one for myself. And the response I got was, we love you, but if you could communicate with us more, right. if you could tell us more. Um, and this was about, seven years ago mm -hmm. and so I really started to communicate and I started to say this is what I'm thinking and I still don't give them a step-by-step -step, you have to do this this and this mm -hmm. um, for my executive team but I say this is the vision and this is what I'm thinking what are you thinking so we communicate just a lot so the biggest thing for me was just assuming that everybody else could go and do it and get it done right. and, and do it on their own um, and not giving that, them that security of here's some standards that it needs to be done by do you consider yourself a natural leader? I do. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm a natural take charge type person. If mm -hmm. there's not a person in the room taking charge, I kind of come in and do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I do, um, but there has to be a lot of training, you know, to be a good one. How do you, uh, how do you describe your leadership style? Now I'm probably the over communicator, um, right. but I am, I am most definitely, I don't know if it's actually a style, but I'm kind of the empowerer. Mm -hmm. I say, hey, here's our standards. You know, I want you to be able to go and do it um, mm -hmm. because I want them to feel good about what they've done mm -hmm. at the end of the day. I wonder before you, you really got, you know, headlong into this business, what you thought made a good leader, what, what your picture of a good leader was then versus what you now know it to be. Is, oh, is there yeah. a contrast there? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I had a horrible picture of a, a good leader. Mm -hmm. I thought it was someone who was pleasant but was always to the point. Um, never showed emotion, never um, opened up any weakness on their own, you know, mm -hmm. was just kind of like, you know, 
get this done, get this done, get this done, and, and you know, move on. Mm -hmm. um, now, however, I see that that showing your weakness to your team um, is very valuable because then they can open up to you. They see that you're not perfect. They don't put you on a pedestal where you're going to fall off. Mm -hmm. You know, we say, hey, we're all human. We're all doing this together. You know, let's. Let's figure this out. You find a lot of leaders that seem like, well, I say leaders, maybe managers or people put in management situations that seem to be a little intimidated by the people who are working for them, which, mm -hmm. uh, which I think does lead to those awkward situations where yeah. they're afraid to communicate. Yeah, yeah. And that's one thing that I, I live by, hire people smarter than me. Um, in the beginning, I remember one time we had some folks come in um, to work for our team and one had been in aerospace for like 23 years, the other one could easily, was easily more qualified to do my job and I remember kind of thinking to myself, why am I in this position and they're not? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm nothing against them but like they're almost intimidating to me and then mm -hmm. I realized, you know what, for whatever reason, I am in this position, I am their boss, I am their leader and I'm going to encourage them to do things you know that are smart and that are efficient let them do their job let them be happy about it and the good thing is they can't take away my position I own right. the company so I'm not gonna be intimidated by them I'm gonna let them flourish mm -hmm. and um, that probably I would say about seven eight years ago that was kind of the idea that I had and it's worked wonderfully for mm -hmm. me I always try to be the dumbest person in the room there you go mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you had a piece of advice or a set of principles that you think if you were going to tell one person these most important principles of being a leader what those might be? Um, absolutely first and foremost hire people smarter than you and let them do their job mm -hmm. um, and that makes you a better person than you would be if you had just if you knew everything mm -hmm. um, and so I would say that and then probably the other thing is um, to make sure that they're looking at the whole person mm -hmm. and that a person is not a number, they're not a check mark, they're not, you know, an employee ID, that they're a whole person. And you will get so much more done if you work as a team and invest in those around you than if you dictate what they do. All right. Gina Radke, the CEO of Galley Support Innovations, thanks for coming in. Thank you. All right.